Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1, verse 1. Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated in the gospel of God, which he had promised afore by his prophets in the Holy Scriptures, concerning his son, Jesus Christ our Lord, which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh. We covered that last time. That's his humanity, his birth as a man upon this earth, and declared to be the Son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. Father, help us as we study your word tonight, concentrate upon the things you've written in the pages of this blessed book, and we'll thank you for it. In Jesus' name, and amen. Now, let's not lose the context as we focus on the details. Here's the context. Jesus Christ was declared to be the Son of God what, what, what is the declaration of his deity, the proof that he is God, was not his birth as the seed of David, but his resurrection from the dead. That he walked out of the grave by his own power showed that he was the superior power in creation. It's one thing to say you're the Son of God. It's another thing to go into the heart of the earth and three days and three nights later come out alive. Hallelujah. Alive forevermore. And there have been men throughout history that God raised from the dead by the miracle working power of Elijah. A widow's, uh, a, a, a woman's son was, was uh, raised from the dead. By the miracle working uh, intervention of God, Elisha's bones raised a man from uh, uh, corpse raised a man from the dead. Uh, walking this earth, Jesus raised people from the dead. And so, but, but nobody ever walked out of that grave. Just said to death, where is thy sting? And to the grave, where's your victory? I'm leaving. And that was the declaration that Jesus Christ was more than just a man. He was, was God Almighty. And thank the Lord for it. So let's look tonight at this, this matter of, of Jesus, the Son of God. It's easy to, to say that, but it's better to be able to prove it and back it up from the Bible. Forty-six times in the New Testament, he's called the Son of God. The name Jesus uh, used for himself most often was Son of Man. That's found 85 times in the New Testament, 81 of them spoken by the Lord himself. It was important to Jesus that he was the Son of Man. He came to, to become acquainted and touched by the feeling of our infirmities and to experience human life so he could be our, our mediator and our great high priest and ever live to make intercession for us. But it's, it's a big deal to us that he's the Son of God. If he's just a man, if he's the best man that ever lived, he's not our Savior. He's not our Redeemer. He's not our High Priest. So uh, he is called in Scripture the Son of God. Come to John chapter 5 and Philippians chapter 2. You can't look at these verses often enough. John chapter 5 and Philippians chapter number 2. John 5 and Philippians 2. I'm not sure what Son of God means, says one man. A Bible writer or commentator says there are many different views on the meaning of of Son of God. But let's see what, what the people to whom Jesus spoke understood when he called himself or declared himself to be the Son of God. John chapter 5, verse 17. But Jesus answered them, My Father worketh hitherto, and I work. Therefore the Jews sought the more to kill him, Because he not only had broken the Sabbath, but said also that God was his Father, making himself equal with God. Everybody see that? So when Jesus Christ called himself or allowed anyone to call him the Son of God, he is declaring, he is allowing it to be declared that he is in every possible way equal to God, we would say God the Father, to God as, as 
The Jews understood there to be a God and understood God to be who he was. Jesus Christ is declaring, I am, I am nothing short of, I am nothing less than, I am nothing inferior to God. Now, in Philippians chapter 2, Philippians chapter 2, and verse number 5, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. Now, if you go on down and read the passage, it talks about how he humbled himself and became a man. But in order for him to humble himself and become a man, he had to be before he became a man. And before he became a man, he was God. Now, Come to Deuteronomy chapter 6. The Jews understood, when Jesus said, I'm the Son of God, they understood he was claiming equality with God. He was not claiming to be a second God. He was not claiming to be a lesser God. He was not claiming to be a created God. Deuteronomy 6, verse number 3. Hear therefore, O Israel, and observe to do it, that it may be well with thee, and that ye may increase mightily, as the Lord God of thy fathers hath promised thee in the land that floweth with milk and honey. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy might. So if he says, I'm the Son of God, And they understood that to mean you are equal with God. And their law says, Deuteronomy 6, which they all knew, the Lord our God is one Lord. They did not think Jesus was claiming to be a rival to the one true God. They did not think that Jesus was claiming to be God number two, but just as good as God number one. They believed him to be declaring himself the one Lord. He is Jehovah manifest in the flesh. That's what he's saying. He's saying, I am God, come down to you in a body of flesh. And they could not accept that. They could not receive that. In fact, we can't go go through the whole thing tonight. But if you read the testimony of, of Paul the Apostle, when he looks back to his life before he was saved... He, he said the one thing, the one thing that he did not do. He kept the law, he lived the life, and, and so forth. He did not believe that Jesus Christ was God. And that one thing kept him, would have kept him from heaven. And, and so he's on the, on the road to Damascus, and God speaks from heaven. And Saul of Tarsus says, Who art thou, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus. And that was it. That's all, that's all Saul needed to hear. And his reply was immediate. Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? What he had to be convinced of was that Jesus Christ was God. And when God spoke to him from heaven and identified himself as Jesus, that was good enough for Saul. It's good enough for me. I, I believe what the Bible says. Now, look at Hebrews chapter number 1. Let's go there. Hebrews chapter 1. Hebrews 1, and with that get John chapter number 10. Hebrews 1 and John 10, we'll read the John passage first. The poor, sincere, hard-working Jehovah's Witnesses... They will lose their souls because they do not believe that Jesus Christ is, was, and always will be the one true God. And the Bible says here in John 10 and verse number 30, one of those verses you memorize the first time you read it, I and my Father are one. And, and the Holy Spirit put a period there. I and my Father are one. And when you witness to the Jehovah's Witness, they try to shove words in between one and the period. One essence, one uh, belief, one 
power, one cooperative for the... Uh, well, what do you mean one? One what? One period. Amen. Amen. Right. One period. Yeah. One in every way it, you can be one. Right. One in every meaning of the word one. Indivisible. Yeah. Absolutely equal. And so what happens, see, ever since the garden, Satan wants you to add to the Word of God or take away from the Word of God. And when you read something in the Bible that you don't understand, he wants you to supply extra words and extra phrases so that your understanding can, can work with, with uh, what, you, what you have after you add words to the Bible. Just leave it alone. I and my father are one. If that's, if that's too big for you to comprehend, just get on your knees and say, thank you, God, for being so big I can't comprehend you. be terrible to have a God that was so small you could figure him out. The <laughs> Bible never said, figure out the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. The Bible says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Amen. Praise the Lord. So, all right, so Hebrews chapter 1. Did I say 1? Okay, Hebrews chapter 1 and verse number 1. Let's just read a little bit of this. God, who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, See that? The glory of God has expressed itself in an image that you can see with your eyes. Got that? The invisible God took upon himself an image. Now here's what's interesting. The Bible says that God made man in his own image, right? But Hebrews says that Jesus Christ was made in the express image of God. Even Adam had the capability and proved it of falling, of failing, of, of, of turning aside. Not Jesus Christ. He's not, he's not just... In the, in the image of man, but he's the express image of God. So, so here's man. Look, there he is. You can see him, but you're not seeing just a man. You're seeing God, the glory of God in an image. You can set your eyes upon him. And so he goes on to say this. Upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high being made so much better than the angels, as he hath by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. For unto which of the angels said he at any time, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. And again, I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. And again, when he bringeth in the first begotten into the world, he saith, And let all the angels of God worship him. That's not a man. That's God. What the angels do in, up there in heaven, they worshiped. They worshiped the Word. Capital W in the beginning was the Word. Words with God. The Word was God. They worshiped Him. He came down here to earth. What changed? Nothing changed. Let all the angels of God worship Him. And of the angels, He saith, who maketh His angels spirits and His ministers a flame of fire. Now watch this. But unto the Son, He saith, Thy throne. O God is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of thy kingdom. Everybody see that? That is the invisible God in heaven saying of the Lord Jesus Christ who has become man. That's God Invisible God in heaven saying to Lord Jesus Christ, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. Amen. If the Father in heaven calls him God, you better call him God. Amen. So I don't see how that Jesus can be God and the Father can be God. And it doesn't matter if you can see how it can be. I don't see how he can speak and create the heavens and the earth. It pretty much 
pretty much nothing God does that I can see how he does it. But I'm going to believe the Bible. And if the Father, sitting in glory, says of the Son walking this earth, you are God, and there's only one God. I'm God, you're God, there's only one God. Then, then our God is the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. You say, one what? Don't add words to the Bible. They're one. Period. That's what he said. These three are one. Period. When you say one what, that requires you to add your understanding or your ideas to the Scripture. Just leave it alone. They're one. All right, John 14. Let's go back to John. John 14. John chapter 14. You say, well, who doesn't believe Jesus is God? Methodists, Lutherans, disciples of Christ, Christian church, um, Mormons, Jehovah's Witnesses, Muslims, Buddhists, Hindus, New Agers, environmentalists. Except for a few Protestant churches still hanging on to the truth of the deity of Christ and the Roman Catholic Church and the evangelicals, pretty much the rest of the world denies that he's God. And here's what the Bible says. John 14, we want to go to the Bible. John chapter 14. If you don't believe the Bible, just believe whatever you want because it doesn't matter. But if you're going to call yourself a Christian, you, you need to believe what the Bible says. So John 14, uh, verse number 6, Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. If ye had known me, ye should have have known my Father also. And from henceforth ye know him, and have seen him. Philip saith unto him, Lord, show us the Father, and it sufficeth us. That's a fair answer, don't you think, to... What Jesus said. Jesus saith unto him, Have I been so long time with you, and yet hast thou not known me, Philip? He that hath seen me hath seen the Father. And how sayest thou then, show us the Father? So, well, come on, Lord, you got to explain that a little bit. Okay, he will, but, but you won't get it. I'll read it with you, but I won't get it. Here's what he said. Um, Believest thou not that I am in the Father, and the Father in me? The words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself, but the Father that dwelleth in me, he doeth the works. Believe me that I am in the Father, and the Father in me, or else believe me for the very work's sake. I don't understand. How can God the Father, how can he be God, and can Jesus be God? Well, Jesus is in the Father, and the Father is in Jesus. See how how that clarified everything for you? Here's what he's saying. If God the Father is up there in the third heaven, on top of that frozen sea of glass, and Jesus Christ is walking down here on this earth, if he's in the Father and the Father's in him, they are not separated, though there is a universe in between them. See, that, that's hard for us to get. Here I am. Come on, watch. Here I am. I, I am I'm, a, I'm a, a spirit and a soul inside a body. Okay? And one day, a storm comes through, and I laughed at it, and the roof caved in, and now I'm absent from the body and present with the Lord. Okay? My, my, my soul and my body are now in two different places. We're, they're, they're separate. And in the resurrection, my body is going to come up, be changed, be glorified, and my soul be reunited with my body. What Jesus said is, I left heaven and came down here to this earth, but I was never separated from my Father. We're not two different beings in two different places. I'm down here, but I'm in my Father, and my Father's up there, but I'm in Him. Well, that's hard to get, isn't it? But see, this is the God that measured 
the waters of the oceans in the hollow of his hand. This is the God that took his arms and stretched out the heavens like a curtain. He's that big. You can't grasp that. I can't grasp that. But I can sure lift up my hands and say, praise God, what a great God. What, a, what an almighty, all-powerful God. Now, look at it again. Come to John 3. John chapter 3. I couldn't put out a red-letter Bible, though I have one in front of me right now, because I really don't know where the red letters are supposed to go in John 3. I'm I'm not sure what's the Holy Spirit writing through John and what's Jesus speaking. But but here's what you got. Uh, Verse 9, Nicodemus answered and said to him, How can these things be? Jesus answered and said unto him, Art thou a master of Israel? And knowest not these things. Verily, verily, I say unto thee, We speak that we do know, and testify that we have seen, and ye receive not our witness. If I have told you earthly things, and ye believe not, how shall ye believe if I tell you of heavenly things? And no man hath ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man, which is in heaven, Now, what do you make of that? He's standing right there talking to Nicodemus. If 13 is a red letter verse, he's standing right there talking to Nicodemus and he says, you know, I'm in heaven right now. (laughs) Well, I thought you came down here. Oh, I did. Yeah, I I came down from heaven and and I'm still there. (laughs) Now, the only way you can explain that is if he's God. And you got some of God bottled up in a human body that was formed in Mary's womb, and you've got some of God sitting up there in the third heaven, and you got some of God, the Holy Ghost, coming down and, and landing on Jesus like a dove. And I, I'm just telling you, it's bigger than anybody. And it's, it's just one of those things, I'm just telling you, the, the virgin birth, the Trinity, the deity of Christ, Several times in my life, I have tried to walk too far into those doctrines to to figure them out. And the Holy Ghost inside, you get so far and he says, you better get out of here. Because you're going to cross a line where you have passed faith and you've entered into reason. And reason's going to wreck your faith. And you start trying to use your little brain to understand God before there was anything. You better just not go there. Because you can't get there. But you can get messed up. There's there's darkness there. Come on, stay with me. The entrance of thy words giveth light. Correct? Correct? Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path, correct? Once you press beyond the Bible because you want to know more than God has told you, you're going to get into darkness. That's not a good place to be. So, I'll, you know, every now and then I'll just get on with these things. You just meditate in a while. And, okay, so, so you go back and there's, there's the beginning. And you go back and there's creation. And you go back and there's the Trinity. And, you, well, yeah, okay, but, yeah, but, but where, just stop. Because you start messing around with that, you're going to have to make something up. Or the devil's going to have to put something in your mind. And now you're in darkness rather than light. Yeah, just just believe the Bible, and and if the Bible takes you to the edge and where where light ends and darkness begins, just say I'm gonna stay right here in the light and enjoy it. And if I need answer to these to these things, I'll get them when I get up there to be with the Lord. Come on, you think you're gonna live forever, and the moment you're raptured, you got nothing left to learn? This little girl, praise the Lord, Good News Club's got started up this week. This little girl asked my wife on Wednesday, she said, well, well, why'd God make all those other planets and if there's only people here on this earth? See, what people, what people failed under, uh, to, to reason is we might be on the very start of this thing. Doesn't that Bible talk about in the endless ages to come? 
Well, how come all those planets are out there and there's nobody on them? Why don't you just, how about nobody on them yet? I'm going to live forever. I'm going to check out every one of them before I'm through. A <laughs> lot to explore, a lot to look at out there. Now, some of you, you're just looking forward to sitting in your mansion and have a rocking chair on your front porch up there and drop a line in that crystal stream and just... I want to see the joint. <laughs> so, John, John chapter 5. John chapter 5. The place, I'm sorry. John 5, 22, For the Father judgeth no man, but the committed all judgment unto the Son, that all men should honor the Son, even as they honor the Father. He that honoreth not the Son, honoreth not the Father which hath sent him. How about that? Y'all meet people in your country believe they're giving honor to God and worshiping God and, and praising God and singing to God, but they deny Jesus Christ? Jesus Christ is due the same honor that the Father is due. Uh, he couldn't say that if they're not equals. It would be very inappropriate. Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter number 1. Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians chapter 1. But you start trying to figure that thing out about how big is the solar system and how many planets are out there and how far is it between this and between that. Does it matter? You're just going to talk yourself out of whatever faith you have. I'm not saying be a dummy. I'm saying know this Bible. This is the revelation God gave of himself, this word. Why do we want a revelation from God? Why are, we, why are we looking for a revelation of God when we have one in our hands? And people will overlook that to try and, well, I'm going to meditate and try to find God. He, he wrote down, I mean, there's enough here to keep you occupied the rest of your life. Why are you trying to trip out into unconsciousness and empty your mind and find... Okay, I'm going to empty my mind and find God. How can you find God when you've emptied your mind? <laughs> That's a weird religion, isn't it? All right, Colossians chapter 1. Colossians 1, verse 16. Um, 15, 14. 14, and whom have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins, there's his humanity, who is the image of the invisible God. See that? God's invisible, Christ is visible, he's God. You want to see God? There he is, Jesus Christ. Firstborn of every creature, for by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. Well, if Jesus Christ is the creator, then he's God. In the beginning, God created the heavens and earth. Who did? Colossians 1, Jesus Christ. And he is before all things, and by him all things consist. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. He was first, and you should make him first. You should allow him to be what he is, preeminent one, first above all things. For it pleased the Father, now, look, now watch, it pleased the Father that in him should all fullness dwell. Colossians Two, verse 9. For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. So in that body, everything that God is and was and will be, all that, that, that is God is in that body. Who's in there? The Word. Who's, in, who's at the, uh, up there in glory? The Father. 
Who's descending like a dove? The Holy Ghost. Which one's God? The Father, the Word, the Holy Ghost. The fullness of God is in that body. The fullness of God is seated in the majesty on earth. The fullness of God is in that spirit coming down to indwell the believer. I don't understand how that could be. Who understands how that could be? Nobody understands how that could be. That's what the Bible says. You understand how your, your, your bones could be in the ground for 2,000 years and a trumpet sounds and they come out and reassemble all your, your, all your organs and your veins and your, your brain, everything else reassembles and, and out it comes. Your soul and spirit go back in that body and just alive as you were the day you were born. You don't understand that. How does blood that was shed 2,000 years ago wash away the sins you're committing today? You don't understand that. You get out there witnessing these, these geniuses want you to explain everything. You're not supposed to explain everything. You're supposed to preach the word. Preach the word. Your explaining isn't going to convert anybody. God's word's going to convert somebody. You say, I don't have an answer for that, but I know this. Jesus Christ died for your sins and rose again. If you believe on him, you can be saved. Oh, yeah, well, what do you think about these aliens? These UFOs, you don't think there's people on other planets? I don't know. I hadn't been to all the other planets, but I know this. Jesus died to pay for your sins and rose from the dead. If you believe on him, he'll save your soul. Well, if, God, if God's love, how come he didn't stop that hurricane out there in the ocean? I don't know. He didn't talk to me about the hurricane, but I know Christ died for your sins and was buried and rose again. If you'll trust him, he'll save your soul. How are you going to explain things to people that believe in Mother Nature and think you can stop a hurricane by crossing your fingers? Now, here's our chief meteorologist. Well, everybody, let's keep our fingers crossed. You're so stupid. Why would I take anything you say seriously when you're asking me to knock on wood and cross my fingers to make a storm as big as France turn and change directions? Let's all go down to the beach and cross our fingers and just stand there in a line. Bunch of pagans, man. This country is a bunch of, bunch of dumb pagans. What if we knocked on wood and rubbed a rabbit's foot at the same time? <laughs> that foot didn't do that rabbit much good. <laughs> <laughs> Don't seem to be too much luck in that thing. <laughs> they make fun of you. Oh, you Christian, you dumb Christians will knock on wood. <laughs> People are so weird, man. Hard to really get spiritual in a hurricane, too, because all they know how to do is light a candle, and they just don't stay lit in, a, in an 80-mile-an-hour wind. <laughs> Got to get you a cigarette lighter. If you don't already have one. Um. All right, so he is the Son of God. As we said, it doesn't make him a second God or a lesser God or a created God. And though the title is not used of him before he became incarnate, he certainly was around before he came down here. Turn your Bible to Micah chapter 5. Micah chapter 5. Please turn and look at this because if you don't have God's Bible, you're not going to have Micah 5 too, the way God wrote it. And then come to Isaiah chapter 9. Micah chapter 5 and Isaiah chapter 9. Micah 5, 2. But thou, Bethlehem, Ephratah, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall he come forth unto me that is to be ruler in Israel. Hey, where, was, where was Jesus born? Bethlehem. Right? Little baby Jesus in the manger in Bethlehem. And what would he grow up to be at his second coming? the ruler in Israel, correct? Ah, but watch. 
whose goings forth have been from old, from everlasting. Look at that. That baby born in a manger has been around forever. He's been going forth from old times. In fact, times started with him. He's back before there was any time. Isn't that interesting? So what do you mean his goings forth were of old? Well, he walked in the garden, made coats of skins to cover a man. He showed up and, when, uh, and confronted Cain about the murder of his brother. He showed up at the Tower of Babel, scattered the people. He came and had a chat with Abraham about offspring. He'd been here many times. Who is that? It's the one who became flesh. He went with Moses up on that mountain. He said, you stand right here, I'll show you my glory. The Bible says he talked with Moses face to face as a man talks with his friend. But he didn't take on a body of flesh until he came from the virgin's womb in Bethlehem, that manger. There he is, God manifest in the flesh. But he's been around from everlasting. From everlasting to everlasting, thou art God. Now look at Isaiah 9. Isaiah chapter number 9. Isaiah 9 and verse 6. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder. And his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. There's a child born who is the mighty God. There's a child born who is the everlasting Father, expressly imaged so that you can behold Him. That's pretty incredible. Verse number 7, Of the increase of His government and peace there should be no end. Upon the throne of David, And upon his kingdom to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth even forever the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. You know what that is? That's Romans 1 verses 3 and 4. There's a man who's going to sit on the throne of David and set up a kingdom, but he's almighty God manifest in the flesh. That son that's born, that child that's given, he's the mighty God. And if you don't know him as the mighty God, you don't know him because that's who he is. Now, let me take this little side road here because we need to do this every so often. I prefer people witnessing to not witnessing. Yes, yes, amen. I prefer people trying to win souls to not winning souls. Amen. Amen. But when you meet the average American who hasn't grown up in church, who's never read the Bible, whose entire mindset is a product of two things, Hollywood and the public school system, and you say to that person, hey, can I just, can I just have five minutes of your time and I promise I won't bother you again. Would you like to go to heaven when you die? Yeah, I guess so. Okay, it's real easy i got a prayer that I want to pray with you. And if you'll pray this prayer, what else? No, no, it's, it's just that simple. Je- Jesus, uh, all of sin and come short of the glory of God and the wages of sin is death. And the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And, and um, if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thy heart that God is ready for death, thou shalt be saved. You, you, you want to pray? You ready to pray? Now, when you get that guy to pray that prayer, And you get his address if you can. And I go to follow up and visit him. And I say, well, now you know that Jesus Christ is God, right? Oh, I don't believe that. 
Well, somebody got him to pray a prayer and told him he was saved, but according to the Bible, he's not saved. Because somebody you don't even know any you don't even know who he is is not going to save you. That Bible doesn't say whosoever shall pray a prayer shall be saved. That Bible says whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord. So, you can't run out there with your tracks in your pocket or your, or your door knocking partner and act like you're living in 1963 and the people you're talking to are third generation Baptists. You're talking to people that know no more about the God of the Bible than if they were raised in Mongolia. And it's going to take a while. The Bible says, believe on, come on, I know you've heard me say this so many, believe on the Lord, that's, that's deity, Jesus, that's humanity, Christ, that's the Savior, and thou shalt be saved. This unknown Jesus, this I don't know who he is, Jesus, this you find out later he was born of a virgin and you don't believe that. You find out later he's God and you don't believe that. That Jesus can't save you because he doesn't exist. So I want to see people saved and I want to win souls. But you don't do it by getting people to pray to an unknown God. You've got to preach the gospel. You've got to give the information so someone can make a right choice based upon the information. Uh, I, I don't mean to be critical. When I say these things, I don't mean to be critical. I, I, I'm, I'm saying this to educate you. I'm not the pastor of America. I'm pastor of this church. I'm not trying to straighten out the whole country. I'm trying to make sure we're straight. But I, I get this newsletter, or I used to get this newsletter, and... and these people go to the, the fair. I thank God they go to the fair, set up a booth, and give out gospel tracts and witness to people. I do. I thank, I thank the Lord for everybody who's trying to do something for Jesus. But every year there'd be these reports. 412 saved of Lush County Fair. 322 saved of Lush County Fair. Uh, had an off year. 190 saved of Lush County Fair. And I, and I would call them and say, what becomes of these people? Well, we give their contact information to area Baptist churches to, to follow up on them. I said, well, we've been in an area Baptist church since 1987. We've never gotten one of those contacts. We get your letter asking for money, but we've never gotten any of your contacts. Oh, well, we'll send you some. So the next year they came to the fair and hundreds and hundreds of people got saved. And they sent us 30 or 40 cards. Name, address, check. I, did you get saved? Check. We went to see every one of those people... Only about three of them would even talk to us. Not one of them had any idea what it meant to be saved, and they didn't want to be saved. Now, they wanted to pray a prayer so they could go to heaven when they died and eat, you know, heavenly catfish and and have a big fish fry forever. But they didn't want anything to do with Jesus Christ. So you tell me what good it does to send 300 people home from a fair thinking, I got two elephant ears, I got got some deep fried Oreos, and I got this card that says I'm going to heaven when I die. All three of them will make you sick. (laughs) So we don't want to get people to say a prayer. We want to... We want to educate people as to who Jesus Christ is. And once they know who he is, we want to encourage them to put their faith and trust in him. And who he is is God Almighty, the creator of the heavens and the earth, who came down here in the form of a man so he could die to pay for your sins. And until you call on him, you didn't get anything but misled. We had 800 saved in our Christmas program. And that next year we had 700 saved in our Christmas program. The year after that we had 900 saved in our Christmas program. But your membership's the same as it was three years ago. I know where I went when I got saved. I went to church. I know where you went when you got saved. You went to church. 
How can, how can 2,400 people get saved in a 24-month period and there, none of them are in church? That's kind of weird. So that's just a little side road that we had to take because we were just screaming. There's a science a detour here. Take the detour. So we took the detour. All right, let's go back to the New Testament. Back to Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1. We've got more to say about this deity of Christ, but we'll not say it tonight. We're just going to wrap up this context here. See, the, the, the coexist bumper sticker, in, in theory, the theory behind it is really a nice one. If, if the Muslim would love the Buddhist and the Buddhist would love the Hindu and the Hindu would love the Taoist and the Taoist would love the Christian, then we, people wouldn't be killing each other and the world would be a better place. And that's true. Then everyone would live longer before they died and went to hell. But the world would be a better place. Now the reason coexist doesn't work is because of us. Every other group on that bumper sticker agrees Jesus was just a man. And Jesus was just one of many nice ideas and many nice philosophies and many nice religions. But you guys with the Bible, you believe he was God, and if he's God, he's the only way to heaven. And so you're the ones messing up the coexist. You bitter clingers holding on to your Bibles. You're the ones standing in the way of peace and harmony and love. and Because after all, whenever there's a riot, it's us. Whenever there's a car bombing or a stabbing, it's... No, wait a minute, it's never us. And yet we're the one group that gets blamed for all the messes that are going on out there. This religion killed this many, and then over here they killed this many, and over here they killed this many. But they're doing that because of the way you guys treat them. Somehow or another, it's always the fu- world peace would be possible if it wasn't for, oh, I don't know, the Prince of Peace. <laughs> the only thing standing in the way of the world getting along is the one who made the worlds. So Romans 1 says this, verse 3, concerning the gospel, verse 1, the gospel, verse 3, concerning His Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh, that's His humanity, and declared to be the Son of God with power according to the Spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. So before this verse, uh, before we leave this verse, we've got to take uh, another couple of looks at it because we have to consider the Spirit of holiness that proves His deity and the resurrection power that, that establishes forever that he is God. And it's all in one person. The throne of David, the humanity. The throne of, of, of heaven, his deity. And all of them wrapped up and combined in one person. Pretty incredible. Pretty incredible. All right, let's pray together. Father, thank you for the Bible. And we ask and pray, Lord, that You'd help us to study it, search it, believe it, love it, proclaim it to the world. And we'll thank you, Father, for keeping us walking in the light. Deliver us from the darkness, uh, the world round about us, and the darkness that would spring up in our minds or in our hearts when we get away from this Bible. And we'll thank you for, for this lamp to our feet, light to our path, your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. In his name we pray. Amen.